Hi there, my name is Liz Ferguson, and in this presentation I'll be sharing a bit more information on estuaries, lagoons, and marshes. So wetlands can be defined as areas where water covers the soil or is present either at or near the surface of the soil all year for varying times of that year. And there's two different categories as described by the EPA as, and five different types or categories of wetland described by NOAA. First, we have the coastal or the tidal uh, categories of wetlands, which are going to include marine or ocean wetlands and estuarine or estuary wetlands. And then secondarily, we have three different inland and or non-tidal forms of wetlands, which includes a riverine or a river system, a lacustrine or a lake wetland, and a palustrine or a marsh wetland. So coastal and tidal wetlands, let's focus on those first. Marine or ocean systems include open oceans regions that overlay the continental shelf and are associated with a high energy coastline. The limit of this marine wetland system is going to be the outer edge of the continental shelf to the inner tidal zone or the edge of the estuary. The estuary system uh, kind of takes over from there, and it's the deep water tidal habitat and adjacent tidal wetlands that is semi-enclosed by land and has access to salt water or marine water and fresh water. These tend to be lower energy systems, and the limit of these estuarine systems are the upstream and landward um, areas where the ocean salts measure less than 0.5 parts per thousand. The seaward element is where the shrubs and the trees are not included. So just to give you a couple graphics on these different wetland regions, here we have the continental slope located at the right edge of this figure. And over on the left-hand side of this figure, we have a dune region along the shore. So somewhere along here, uh, from that dune down to uh, about here or so is where we have that intertidal region. And from there we have the subtidal region, another little intertidal region, and another subtidal region. So you can, anything, anything wherein there is going to be um, typically no water covering uh, part of the system, such as this little, oh sorry, such as this little Oh yeah, no, the intertidal section here. So even if there's not water continually covering this section because of the fact that it's found within this space between the continental slope and the dune area, we include that in this marine system and define it as a form of a wetland. There's gonna be exposure to waves in these systems and they uh, there's gonna be a combination of subtidal as well as intertidal uh, sections to it. For the estuarine system, this is typically going to be what we think of as estuaries uh, or wetlands. A lot of times we refer to the word wetland and that can mean an estuary or a bay or something along those lines. But estuaries tend to have more of a protect, protected region that is submerged at times during the, uh, during the day. Some regions of it are going to be continually submerged. You have these upland areas, so regions that are above that waterline, as far as the waterline goes. And then you have regions that are covered in the, uh, within the tidal water um, intermittently, as well as kind of consistently down along the bottom. Um, there's going to be different types of uh, substrate that's along the bottom of each of these. And there's going to be a very, um, it's going to be semi-enclosed to land and have access to that open ocean water. Yeah, I should also mention that sometimes lagoons are included in that reference to these types of wetlands. So just to give you an idea of the difference between lagoons and estuaries, there is are a couple features that we can use to differentiate between those two. Lagoons tend to be shallow, whereas estuaries, estuaries are going to be a bit deeper than lagoons. Um, there's typically no large rivers flowing into a lagoon, but there always is for an estuary. You're always going to have an inflow of fresh water from some form of a river into an estuary. The flow dynamics are going to be sluggish and slow then for the lagoon and obviously faster. Water flow is going to be a bit faster for that estuary due to the access to the river. Due to the access to the river. 
Um, and then we have something called a flushing time, which is how long it takes for fresh a fresh batch of water to kind of be flushed into the system from either the ocean or the river. In the lagoon, it's going to be take a long time as it's a little bit more restricted, and the estuaries are going to widely vary. So the flushing time is really dependent on the tides or the upstream freshwater inflow. Um, so there's going to be some variability there. Now, inland and non-tidal wetlands are going to be a bit different. The riverine system, or river system, is going to be wetlands that are contained within a channel. They tend to be um, ones, however, that are not dominated by trees and moss and have a greater, uh, greater than 5, 0.5 parts per thousand salinity. Lacustrine systems, or lakes, are going to be permanently flooded lakes and reservoirs. Um, they can also include intermittently flooded lakes, though, and something called tidal lakes, which are greater than 0 0.5 parts per thousand salinity. And then with the palestrine systems, it's going to be dominated by trees, shrubs, and uh, typically will have a very low water level. Uh, again, same salinity level. And we refer to these oftentimes as marshes or swamps, bogs or fens. They tend to be small and shallow, or consist of small, shallow water bodies, such as ponds. And just to take a look at the graphics for these three different systems, this is an example of the, um, the riverine system. Here, too, you, you should note that there are some specific types of plant life that are typically going to exist on either side of this riverine system and the other wetland regions. And you're going to typically have varying levels of uh, water levels for each of these, uh, for, the, for the riverine system, dependent on what's contributing to that river system water. Uh, the water flow is typically always going to be flowing. The palestrine and other wetlands may occur adjacent to these riverine systems as well. For the lacustrine system, as you can imagine with the lake, um, we can have uh, different levels of, of the water level for different la for lakes uh, that can fluctuate either seasonally or you know, temporarily get flooded, or things along those lines. Uh, the lacustrine region is tended, tends to be um, surrounded by, on either side, this palustrine section as well, or, or type of wetland as well. It's situated in a depression or a river channel in order to kind of retain more of that water. And the trees, shrubs, and moss are going to make up greater than 30% coverage. And with these lacustrine systems, we're typically referring to an area that has a, it's a little bit larger in size. It's generally going to be a minimum of 20 acres in size or more. And then for the palestrine system, here you have a bit more variability. As you can see when we zoom in a bit, there's going to be much lower levels of water, but that can fluctuate as well. You have it broken into um, sections such as the aquatic bed, the emerging wetland, and then the persistent wetland. So another element to note is that you're going to have some of these uh, moss and other structures that are found within these marshy regions. So let's take a closer look at estuaries. Estuaries are partially enclosed bodies of water that are characterized by a mix of salt and fresh water, something we refer to as brackish water. And in San Diego, we have this incredibly large Tijuana estuary. I think it's the largest estuary in our county. And on the bottom here, the San Diego River estuary. So there's variability in terms of the how those, uh, the layout and whatnot of those different estuaries. Uh, there's a zone of, they're considered a zone of transition between the land and the ocean. And they're going to be typically influenced by tides and protected from wave action, which is going to constitute or be um, um, a little bit more active in that marine wetland region. Estuaries can either be referring to or kind of corresponding to bays, lagoons, and harbors, and sounds. And are oft, these terms are often used interchangeably to describe estuaries. So you'll see a bit of variability in terms of the, either the naming convention of a particular estuary or um, how it's referred to by individuals. 
Estuaries are highly productive habitats due to high levels of nutrients in the water column and in the sediment. So as you can see in this figure to the right hand side, we have the net primary productivity along the x-axis calculated as uh, kilocals per meter squared per year. And then we have several different categories of uh, marine as well as, as wetland kind of regions um, and also some terrestrial regions as well. So the estuary swamps and marshes that we're referring to here now have a comparable level of net primary productivity to tropical rainforests and coral reefs. So as you can imagine, that makes them incredibly, incredibly important regions and habitats um, that, that will feed into and that, whose nutrient cycles will contribute to uh, surrounding habitats and ecosystems. Salt marshes and mud flats tend to have this sub habitat or sub habitats within the estuary and within these kind of riverine and lacustrine systems. Estuaries are going to vary with respect to the plant and animal communities. So each individual estuary that you find can have a very unique diversity and assemblage of organisms, which makes them so incredibly important as well. In this particular figure off to the left hand side, we have um, an example of just a salt marsh where you have the nutrient rich sediments and water that lead right up to uh, a segment or section of, of grass, some type of seagrass as well as salt marsh plants. Uh, whereas a mud flat, you'll have a segment just in between the, the vegetation area and the water line that consists of just kind of a very nutrient rich mud that a lot of organisms tend to exist in. There's several different forms or types of estuaries in terms of the, the topographical features that are going to form them. The drowned river valleys or the coastal plain estuaries, which are uh, demonstrated or I guess depicted in this figure in the upper right hand side, are going to be the most common type that are encountered. And essentially the drowning of lowland around the mouth of the river when the sea level rose after the last ice age is what kind of formed these. Um, examples of these in San Diego include the Tijuana Estuary, Hedionda, Barraquitos. Uh, there's a couple others within San Diego County. And here you can see we have a river with uh, delta, which is going to be a sediment that's built up over time as the output, as it kind of follows down the river and is deposited at the mouth of that river. And then the estuary kind of forms just below that. Tectonic estuaries can also form, as you can see on the right hand side here, which they're going to form as a result of land sinking and the crust moving. So you have the crust of the earth that can, at these convergence points, is going to shift and change around, and that's going to form these different you know, reservoirs of water that, um, uh, that will be characteristically described as an estuary. A good example of this would be San Francisco Bay. And moving to the other two types, we also have a find bar built estuaries, which are sandbars deposited and protected wetlands. Um, so you've got a sandbar that uh, results from deposition of some sediment and the built up of that sediment over time. And as that increases in size, it will uh, cut off access to the, the salt water there or the ocean water there. And well, there'll be some It'll just act as a barrier. It won't be completely excluded because otherwise it wouldn't be an estuary. Um, and it'll just kind of form this little reservoir. Good examples of this are the Gulf Coast of Texas, North Carolina, and the, in the Netherlands. And then we have fjords, which are going to be deep channels cut in the coastal zone as a result of retreating glaciers. These tend to be really deep and narrow, and we find examples of these in Alaska and Norway. San Diego is home to several different estuaries. In the North County, we find several different lagoons, uh, a series of different lagoons along the coast. And sadly enough, these lagoons have been kind of whittled down through development as well as other, you know, other kind of anthropogenic influences have been whittled down to these small areas. However, we still do have these and they are protected lands. In the southern part of San Diego County, we have the Kendall Frost Mission Bay Marsh Reserve. So you probably have visited that at Mission Bay and had the chance to, to um, check out some of those marshes up close. The San Diego Bay Sweetwater Marsh and the Tijuana Estuary. 
communities of organisms are going to find these as ecosystems incredibly important. Um, these there's several different characteristics that are that are inherent to these different estuaries. First is the fact that they offer flood control. So flooding of of these different um, habitats from offshore rivers is going to be kind of retained and captured within that estuary. It's going to have some flood control there. And these estuaries serve as the juvenile nursery for many marine organisms, including fish and cetaceans. They also act as a natural biofilter for excess nutrients and mineral, minerals being deposited from the river system. Uh, so just an example of the filter effects, as water flows through a salt marsh, marsh grasses, marsh grasses and the peat, that's a spongy mix of live roots and decomposing organic material and soil, are going to filter out pollutants such as herbicides, pesticides, and heavy metals. Um, this also will deal with excess sediments and nutrients, um, and this is just a description of what, how that filter, filtering works uh, within that marshland or within that wetland. Um, another characteristic of our kind of function of these ecosystems is their protection and stabilization of the shoreline from erosion and storms. Um, they're also responsible for supporting migratory bird populations and a wide for and a wide diversity of those birds as well. We find that there's different niches within the estuary. So, for example, um, some organisms are going to be air breathing and need to feed on def detritus, algae, and fungi that grow on the salt marsh plants, such as this coffee bean snail on the left hand side. Um, and the marsh periwinkles on the right-hand side. So this is just one kind of section of the marshland that these organisms tend to inhabit. Um, whereas the mudflat areas are going to be inhabited by myofauna, so interstitial organisms or animals, such as worms and ciliates and copepods, that are going to be feed along the detritus and other materials that are found within those different sediments. Um, and then within a mangrove forest, we find something slightly different. So within the mangrove forest, we have animals such as sponges that provide nitrogen compounds, protection from, oh, sorry, and protect the roots from isopods. There's polychaetes as well as mud shrimp and clams in the muddy bottom and a rich nursery of many different species. Within the open water regions of an estuary, oftentimes we find catadromous fish fishes, which are going to be organ fish that migrate from fresh water to spawn in the sea. So example is the longfin eel here, as well as the European eel, but also a good example would be um, salmon. Um, within the estuaries, you can have either a semi-enclosed estuary, where there's going to be access to um, the seawater, but there will also be regions that protect more from that wave action and kind of make the entrances to that seawater um, kind of smaller. Um, and in those different different estuaries, there's an increased abundance of, of fish species or organisms such as blue crabs, snappers, and gulf flounders. Um, in the open estuaries where there isn't that barrier or intermittent barrier occurring due to sandbars or things like that, you find a greater abundance of other fishes, fish and species such as bay scallops, and black sea bass. So the assemblages and diversity of organisms are going to vary depending on the opening and access to that seawater as well. Estuary birds have a quite large diversity as well. In the coastal wetland, we have migratory as well as resident species. And uh, just to give you an idea of the diversity in these different regions in San Diego, um, in San Alijo Lagoon, there's approximately 300 species that are that either migrate to these lagoons or are residents. In the Kendall Frost Marsh, there's 144 different species. And then Tijuana Estuary, which I mentioned is the largest estuary in San Diego, has approximately 370 species of bird that rely on it. These include species such as the juvenile least tern and the snowy egret. Additionally, we find more predatory species such as the juvenile, or sorry, the larger prey predators, such as the juvenile, juvenile Cooper's hawk and the clapper rail. 
Plants are also uh, an interesting and diverse assemblage within these regions. There are several different common plants found in coastal wetlands. Um, their characteristics include the fact that they are herbaceous, so there's no woody stems above the ground to make them a little bit lighter, so they don't have to have as an extensive or solid foundation. Uh, they're adapted to aquatic saline habitats, and oftentimes they're going to consist of succulents and grasses. So off to the left-hand side, pickleweed's a great example you find quite commonly in San Diego. Um, by not having that woody stem, they're able to deal a lot better with these muddy or less solid uh, soil kind of characteristics. It's an example here of California bulrush, and another one commonly found uh, plant is salt grass. Loss of wetlands is a huge issue that we've faced within our within our coastal environments, within our coastal communities. And as I mentioned, there's a these estuaries act as nurseries for a wide diversity of species. They also act as a filter and a buffer for flooding as well as nutrient overloading and things along those lines. So the destruction of these wetlands and the loss of these habitats can be quite critical and, um, and bad for the associated and adjacent marine ecosystems. So since the 1700s, there's been more than half of all wetlands in the lower 48 states lost. Uh, Florida and, and Louisiana had the greatest area of wetlands and have lost about 50% of those. And this map over on the right-hand side indicates states with the highest wetland lost and their percentages. California has lost a little over 90% of its wetlands. And in Southern California, we only have 30 salt marshes remaining. A good example of kind of the historical extent change in these wetlands um, includes the Bayona Lagoon in uh, Los Angeles. Historically, this wetland occurred within the entirety of this region. So this entire space was included in that wetland. Currently, though, our current day extent um, has dropped that 14,000 acres of wetland down to about 600 of acres of wetland. And that was in 2017, so we've probably had a reduction since then. San Diego wetland lost is also a, um, you know, significant, as you can imagine, so part of the California wetland loss. Um, if you take a look at this map, we see that the historical lagoon, oops, sorry, I'll zoom in a bit. It, historically, and this is kind of where we see a good example here, the orange is where the lagoon, the extent of the lagoon from historical data. Um, and the kind of shaded green, planty green here, is the current day extent of those lagoons. So as you can see from the San Alija Lagoon and oh, specifically the San Diego Lagoon and the Los Penasquitos Lagoon, we've drastically reduced the amount of actual wetland that's present, um, which as you can imagine has big impacts for these marine ecosystems as well as any the diversity of species within those within these regions. We were a highly diverse region, um, more diverse region, I should say, in terms of species than we are today. A uh, similar thing happens in the northern county, although um, likely due to the uh, slower development in North County, some of that greater extent of these different lagoons or wetlands have been retained. So Tijuana Estuary, San Diego Bay, and Mission Bay is only about 13% of its historical area, just to give you uh, an idea in terms of a number there. So I hope this is giving you a good background on estuaries.